Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you for um, registering for today's webinar on um, the coronavirus and Australian business. Um, my name's Sarah O'Leary. I um, work with PR at MIOSH, um, Health and Safety Management Software. Uh, we have an extensive um, audience of HSC professionals, HR managers, and we do a lot of industry-specific webinars. Um, we decided sometime last week that we should get some information out on this emerging pandemic. Um, I, I noticed that Harmer's Workplace Lawyers had recently done a webinar last week and I contacted them and uh, one of their marketing lady, Jane, has been absolutely fabulous in helping us get this off the ground so quickly. So I really want to um, thank the team at Har Harmer's. They've been really wonderful to get this um, launched for today. So um, just a little bit before I introduce them, um, the webinar panel has a Q&A section. I hope you can see it for typing questions in that hopefully we'll get to at the end. We are recording this webinar. It has been oversubscribed, but um, people can contact us. We'll send a video link. We'll also make a podcast out of it and a slide share, but that will take about a day. Um, and all that will happen hopefully by email tomorrow. So um, yes, thank you very much to Harmers. I'm going to hand over to Michael Harmer. He's the chairman and senior team leader. Um, and then there'll be Madeline Boyd. She's a senior associate and Zeb Holmes solicitor. And they're going to run through the webinar today. So over to you, Michael, thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and welcome everyone to today's uh, Lunch and Learn webinar. If you're uh, in the Eastern States or if you're in WA, that's a uh, breakfast and learn. Either way, uh, we hope that it gives you some edification. The topic, of course, is the coronavirus, its impact on Australian business and workplace relations issues. Uh, we've had uh, in excess, as I understand it, of 500 registrations for today's session. And whilst uh, Maddie and Zeb were urging me last week that that was because they joined me uh, differently to the last webinar where we didn't have quite those numbers. Um, uh, it is, however, strongly indicative of just how important to Australia business the impact of this uh, emerging pandemic is and how important it is to at least attempt to stay ahead of the game. But look, it's a it's a extremely rapidly moving game. And given that we have online so many people who are experienced in work health and safety and particular risk management, uh, I think you'd all be following this carefully. And I guess viewing how the nation as a whole is coping with risk management issues and measures which I guess are your bread and butter and which you've been well trained in. If I look at the financial review today, there's a front page diagram on the potential 4 million peak uh, of this pandemic in Australia and uh, illustrations of how quarantine, isolation and other risk management measures might smooth it out so that our health system can cope. Uh, and uh, rather than having a very high peak, hopefully we get a lower peak uh, with a far reduced level of fatalities. But it's certainly the extension of your professional expertise to the nation and to every person in the nation. And you're no doubt a vital link in the chain that is going to help our community cope. Now, as you're all aware, uh, today's presentation is uh, workplace health and safety issues, yes, but uh, in a wider context of workplace relations issues because there are a large number of issues for businesses to cope. And so we'll, while we'll touch certainly on risk management, uh, the setting is a wider context of workplace relations. The coronavirus itself has a double impact, of course. Uh, there's the immediate health concerns, which are a major but there's also the wider impact on the global and the Australian economy. And there are different rights and obligations attaching to the ways in which business would cope with each of those respective risks. Now, whilst that gives rise to a large number of legal issues, we're also confronted with a large number of moral and ethical issues. And to a large extent, there's a corporate social responsibility issue here over and above the legal obligations that we'll be talking about in due course. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, the way in which the Australian economy and people cope with this 
confrontation uh, depends on the strength of the chain and we're only going to be as good as um, our weakest link in that chain and uh, indeed um, one doesn't want our business or anyone associated with it to be that weakest link. So there is, if you like, a real challenge in corporate social responsibility for all businesses to do all they can to assist the Australian government and the general community as vital links in that chain. Now, in terms of workplace health and responsibility, um, that, that branches in this instance, obviously to the physical impact of this virus, but vitally also to the mental health impacts. And you'd all be aware, aware uh, just as to the level of, uh, I won't say panic, but certainly genuine concern in the community, which has been witnessed through understandable stockpiling, given that people have been talked to about potential periods of self-isolation in their home and things of that nature. And so, you know, there's a level of personal risk management which is playing out here. And as businesses, we have a responsibility to cope with not only assisting in the chain of community health reaction to this pandemic, but also to assist in mental health impact, where I think a large number of people on top of the bushfires are also already suffering fatigue and a great deal of stress over this and business is one vital link in assisting in communication and reassurance that might bring that level of pressure down. Now just in relation to that whilst we do have the work health and safety dimension there's also a business continuity dimension to this and a survival issue and that needs to be properly balanced. Uh, otherwise, if people are working from home or have been stood down and are watching on while a business dissipates during the course of this, that also is going to be a source of great distress with people not having a job to return to even after the virus threat is over. So there's a, a real balancing act there to deal with and a, a real role in communication and insurance. And uh, just as many of us uh, would be practicing mindfulness, uh, we'd be trying to, of course, stay calm in the present moment whilst planning for the future contingencies and striking that right balance uh, between work health and safety issues and being compliant with the government reasonable directions, uh, but at the same time, keeping an eye on business viability and the overall security in a mental health sense uh, of everyone associated with our business. Now, the government is doing, of course, a good job in getting a lot of information out. You'd all be um, following the World Health Organization's output and also the various departments of health. Uh, and those of you in the safety space would be following information from Safe Work Australia and from the various safe work entities which have translated guidance to PCBUs and risk management around the country. Uh, and of course, the uh, Fair Work Ombudsman uh, and even the Fair Work Commission have issued guidance in relation to this area. So there's a great deal of information out there. And as the Prime Minister has told us all, um, there is an expectation that business will play a very responsible role in, for example, looking after contractors or casuals, things of that nature, in recognition that the government can only go so far, but there's a reality to Australian business whereby Australian business can also only go so far. And there's a need for business planning adjustments in the face of this challenge, cognizant of all relevant stakeholders. Now, just going to the next slide, um, our co-presenters today are Madeline Boyd. Hi there, everyone. And Zeb Holmes. Hi, thanks for joining. And uh, I'll shortly be taking you through the, the agenda that we're all going to, um, to follow. But uh, of course, if we were doing this uh, webinar face-to-face, -face, uh, we'd probably be greeting many of you coming through the door uh, with handshakes, etc., in, in days gone by. Uh, but of course, this is a webinar, which is a very coronavirus safe and friendly mode of communication. Uh, and if you came into our uh, 
front reception at the moment, you'd see a sign indicating that we no longer shake hands and that's been there for a couple of weeks now, but we give a respectful bow. Uh, and uh, I was actually last week meeting early in the week with the CEO of a, a large public listed entity, a household name that you'd all recognise. And we had a bit of a laugh as we gave a respectful bow from either side of our boardroom, but it was a segue to a good discussion on how business can best cope with this challenge and what steps are being taken in our respectful businesses. And that was good food for thought. And that's all that this session is. We, we don't profess to have all the answers any business does in the circumstances, uh, but certainly uh, hopefully it'll give you some food for thought to assist you in your own endeavors. Now, We've got quite a range of attendees across all different sizes of business and all different levels of expertise. Many of you are ahead of what we're talking about today, uh, but uh, hopefully it will be of value to all of you. Um, I know that it's been indicated by Sarah that she'll be circulating the slides and the recording, uh, and so any of your uh, comrades at work that may not have been able to attend, hopefully they can catch up with uh, anything of value from the webinar uh, and uh, hopefully we'll give you all something of value to take away. Now just going to the next slide, we've got our agenda for today and in essence is just going to make some further introductory comments on the coronavirus and a risk management context. At items two and three we'll then briefly explore uh, rights and obligations. It'll be a brief survey given the limited timing we've got. Um, have a look at um, some risk management planning issues and how one might change manage the introduction of that risk management model. Uh, then at item six, we're going to look at practical steps, trips and traps, and really that's going to cover some of the main issues and risks that are confronting employers. And if we just go to the next slide, it's basically taken from uh, a webinar which uh, l &E Global undertook on the 2nd of March, 2020. Now, Harmers is a partner in l &E Global, which is uh, a leading cross-border cross firm in the world. It consists purely of workplace relations lawyers in excess of 1,500 across the globe and uh, basically they do due diligence and pick the best workplace relations firm in each country to join that partnership. Now on the 2nd of March, they undertook a webinar emanating from their China, United States, Germany, France and UK firms. And they based it around what they discerned having consulted across the various firms across the globe to be the 10 most prominent questions emerging from uh, the coronavirus in terms of what they're being asked by employers. And what uh, Maddie and Zeb are going to do um, is basically take you through those top 10 questions. I'll just take the time to read through them now because you might during the course of the webinar have a number of questions that you want to ask and by telegraphing that we're going to cover these areas, it might at least save you sending questions on these topics. But of course, if you have other questions, we'll certainly attempt at the end of the webinar to get to them all and to answer as many as we can. So just quickly moving through them. Uh, one, how should employers handle international travel? Two, who presents a risk in the workplace, even if they're asymptomatic? Three, should employees with recent travel to China stay home? Four, what if an employee has a family member at home with COVID-19? Five, do employers have to pay employees who are away from work due to concerns of exposure? Six, what steps should employers require before allowing employees to return to work? Seven, what communication steps should an employer take if an employee has contracted COVID-19? Eight, what steps should an employer take if an employee or customer client is confirmed to have COVID-19 after being in our workplace? Nine, are there steps employers sh should take now to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace? And 10, what pandemic planning steps should employers consider to be able to continue to operate their business in the event of further potential community outbreaks? Now, you would have all appreciate that even since the 2nd of March, things have moved rapidly on from when those questions were emerging and Maddie and Zeb have been updating the answers to those questions uh, for each webinar that we give. 
uh, and they'll give you the most up-to-date response to those risks today and no doubt you'll have other issues that you want addressed. So just going back to the agenda with the next slide, um, basically we'll, by way of overview, come, cover some rights and obligations, risk management, change management, then drill down into those 10 areas of risk. We'll then look at a brief case study, which just to keep it simple, although we're fielding queries and helping a large number of businesses to deal with this area, we'll just take an example of what our firm is doing by way of brief illustration uh, and then try and turn to your questions, which by sharing the answers and discussion around them, hopefully will give you a further wash um, of some value. Now, we'll just go to the first item on the agenda then in terms of an introduction to the coronavirus and uh, its potential impact on Australian workplaces. And uh, look, there's a lot of information out there and I don't intend to waste your time going over it in too much more detail, but I do want to make a few brief observations from a risk management perspective in terms of its context for business. Uh, you're probably all following the World Health Organisation information and we have today approaching approximately 160,000 cases across the globe, um, approaching 6,000 deaths uh, and a linear increase across the globe of uh, this pandemic. And if you take the example of a country such as Italy, it from a position of less than where Australia suddenly or currently stands, was suddenly thrust into the number two country in the world uh, and listening even in the past week to a number of Italian folk interviewed, um, they all wished that there were further risk management steps taken when they had numbers such as Australia. And so what you see Australia doing is trying to uh, flatten out that risk and try and keep the pandemic at a level where our health services can cope um, in circumstances where it's going to be of quite some duration. Now, uh, in Australia, we currently have um, around 300 cases. Um, and when we were doing a similar webinar mid last week, it was 100 cases. And you've probably heard um, risk analysis of the rate of doubling, uh, which is how quickly it takes for the number of people impacted to double. Now, that's tripled since last week and it's anticipated that that will accelerate and you don't need to do too much doubling. Um, they expect that it'll get you know, down to less than daily, we'll have a doubling and hence the numbers would go on quite an exponential. And it's the risk management around nipping that in the bud, if you like, and keeping it at a tolerable level, uh, which is what everyone's so concerned about. Now, again, if I go back only two weeks, we had the first, um, human to human transmission at the start of um, the two week period, two weeks ago. Uh, and things have really escalated um, since then. By the end of that first week, uh, we had Epping High closed. We had Clayton Utes on the Thursday before the Friday uh, of that first week sent home its workforce along with Vodafone. And then last week you would have seen escalation further with Companies like Qantas, which is obviously at the forefront of the impact of all that's been happening, uh, discussing reduction of 30% across its senior workforce uh, in their pay and the fact that they already had 2,000 employees surface to requirements. Now, that gives rise to some real workplace relations issues which we need to touch on. Uh, and this is now accelerating even more rapidly coming into this week and you would be reading today of very large businesses, Telstra over the weekend, some major accounting and legal firms today announcing that they're already getting their workforces to work from home. Now, that's something that's not all that easy for every business. And so we all need to do the best we can in the circumstances. Now, the coronavirus itself, of course, is a group of viruses that include SARS and MERS. They attack the respiratory system. Uh, a novel coronavirus is, of course, a new stream thought to have come from animals and therefore being new, our immune system is not readily able to cope with it and hence the threat that it's presenting. It's called COVID-19, that stands, stands for CO corona, VI virus and D disease and 19 for the year in which it emerged, so COVID-19. 
Now you've heard that it has a mortality rate ranging perhaps on average around 1%, although there's uncertainty around that because of potential major underreporting across the globe, um, but up to 15% with the aged, and you've all seen those graphs, no doubt, with the increasing risk level um, across various levels of age. And that, of course, allows us to, across the demographic of our own workforce, pick levels of risk exposure. Now, there's a wider context long term to all of this uh, in terms of once we do come through this pandemic, uh, your area of expertise will be much required because you'd be aware that the World Health Organization and many others for many years now have in fact been warning that a major consequence of climate change is, of course, you know, increases in the scope, nature, and transmissibility of infectious diseases with obviously those diseases being capable of manifesting at the different temperature levels in a way that we are not used to coping with. And so if one takes 2050 as a mark around climate change turnaround, uh, we have the next 20 to 30 years to cope with this sort of issue. And if you went back the last 20 years, obviously you would come across SARS and MERS as reasonably periodic indications and probably many of you over the past week or so have re-listened to a Bill Gates TED talk that he gave in 2015 when he indicated that there was a real need for the globe to take risk management measures around the next pandemic and of course the extent of measures have not been implemented and we're now paying the price for that. Now in immediate uh, sense and uh, I guess immediate to medium term this coronavirus, you will have heard, has up to 18 months before, before we uh, find an, a vaccine, have it properly tested and distributed. Now, even if it's as short to 12 months, which would be very rapid, um, that 12 to 18 month period is a long period in which the world has to cope uh, with the coronavirus. And in a risk management sense, uh, you need to be planning for at least 18 months uh, of stages of moving through this particular um, virus. Now, the government uh, through the Department of Health has a national emergency response plan that you all probably have read. Um, it has three escalation scenarios uh, and a number of stages dealing with basically uh, prevention, uh, preparedness, reaction and recovery uh, in terms of standing down post the episode. Uh, we're encouraging business to look to that plan to calibrate their own risk management steps to the scenarios that the government has projected and are dealing with, just so there's a level of synergy in the nature of the communication. And I'd certainly encourage you to um, all be across that National Emergency Response Plan, which again is just an example of your area of risk management being applied to this issue. Now, near term, the Prime Minister in his speech last week talked about the role of business and uh, that's all very well, but business can only go so far. You'd be all be aware that there's many sectors already heavily impacted by the bushfires and now the coronavirus impact. And last week in the financial review, there was a large number of stories about insolvencies already occurring in the economy. And that's a sad part of what's happening and will happen over the next 18 months if we're not all careful. Uh, secondly, many businesses in Australia, unless you're in an area that services people on holidays, etc., suffer a major downturn in their cash flow in December, January. It's a very quiet period for business. And coming out of December, January, you get a cash flow lurch in uh, February and March and then build strongly through the June quarter. Now, of course, we're going to have a somewhat potentially suppressed June quarter and indeed a tough 18 months. And so businesses are what not well placed cash flow wise and looking at the government stimulus package and seeing how it might assist your business through is obviously one step, but we all need to be planning on how we're going to deal with that issue of cash flow interruption. The third point I'd make is that you will have heard many entities in the Northern Hemisphere speculating that with summer approaching in the Northern Hemisphere, they might have some respite from the sort of colds and other symptoms that might reduce uh, immune systems and stem the tide, if you like, of the spread of infection by this virus. 
We, of course, in the southern hemisphere are heading into our winter and probably a, an increased level of risk. So unlike the northern hemisphere, we face a major challenge. And you probably would have seen speculation in the press from uh, one university professor last week, given the age nature of the Australian population, um, that Australia could end up with one of the highest mortality rates in the world from this particular virus. And indeed, on the 3rd of March, there was a projection by an economist, obviously feeding in data from health sources, that projected a particular uh, potential loss of life of 68 million across the globe uh, and in excess of 100,000 in Australia, uh, not uh, dissimilar to the um, Spanish flu incident immediately after the First World War that we've been hearing so much about in recent weeks. Now that's the level of the risk. Obviously we hope it doesn't emerge to that extent, but that's the nature of the challenge. At the same time, we've got to keep business running. We're all familiar with the risk management measures and some of the symptoms that have been talked about in terms of fever, restricted breathing, coughs, etc. Uh, and there's a need for a calibration point where you would require someone to work from home or step out of the business and if that calibration point is too soft, if going into the Australian winter, uh, you're taking that measure just in relation to people who have a common cold, which is just another form of coronavirus, uh, or at least a contribution from coronavirus, um, not the novel one of COVID-19, but a more general one, uh, you're going to be unduly penalising your business and potentially not striking the right balance. Now, as I mentioned before, we all want to comply with the government's directions, but we've got to take a pragmatic approach to protecting business. Now, forgive me for that general introductory Ray, but I'm just talking about some of the challenges facing us in risk managing this issue, and it's very rapidly moving. Uh, even measures we were talking about uh, last week or may talk about today could be redundant tomorrow just because it's moving so fast. But if we go to the next slide against that context, um, we're just going to look at your rights and uh, obligations as uh, operators of businesses, um, PCBUs, and to that end, if we just go to the next slide, I'm just going to conduct a very high level survey. Uh, obviously, we uh, encourage you, and no doubt you have, um, to audit your obligations in this space, be they statutory, contract, uh, award EBA based policy and procedure within your business. Uh, but moving to the first item there that we've set out in that diagrammatic survey, um, work health and safety legislation is obviously what many of you would be familiar with dealing with and you'd understand that that embodies many risk management principles and puts them into a legal framework. Now obviously we all have that duty in effect to take all reasonably practical steps to ensure safety in the circumstances of this coronavirus. And that extends not only to our employees, but to everyone who comes into contact in any way, shape or form with our business. And there's very significant due diligence obligations on the senior management of your business that you need to be helping them fulfil in dealing with this very difficult challenge. Now, one of the obligations under the model work health and safety legislation across the country uh, is the notion that there is a duty to consult with all other duty holders, be they employees, contractors, other businesses, suppliers, clients, customers, etc., with a view to having an integrated approach to risk management. And we'd encourage you to audit those risks at both a micro uh, and macro level, as I'll, I'll come to later on in the presentation. So there's a very critical area that we touch on very briefly, I appreciate. Secondly, there's human rights and equal opportunity legislation. Now, if you take reasonable and commensurate steps in response to dealing with this virus, you shouldn't have any difficulty at all. But if obviously you start to take steps against uh, particular races, um, uh, where it's not necessary in context of the virus, or if you attribute um, conditions to certain individuals who might just have a common cold uh, and impact them, such as uh, putting them out of the workplace without, for example, pay, uh, one could easily face uh, either race discrimination or disability discrimination cases or general protections cases under the Fair Work legislation. 
but if you take reasonable and commensurate steps, you shouldn't have difficulty. And there are, of course, exemptions in the human rights legislation. Uh, firstly, in the interest of public health, where you are taking steps to, in the public interest, deal with a, an infectious disease. Uh, and secondly, in the area of steps necessary to comply with, amongst other things, work health and safety legislation. So you have a fair bit of support in taking reasonable steps uh, whilst maintaining exempt immunity, if you like, from interference with the discrimination legislation. But again, there's a reasonable balance to be struck there. Thirdly, and extremely importantly, is the workplace relations legislation. I mentioned the general protection provisions, which of course carry significant discrimination provisions, uh, and there are other rights under the legislation that could come into play. Um, the safety net is embraced in the fair work legislation with the national employment standards where you have your annual leave rights and the right to give reasonable direction for people to take annual leave is necessary in this circumstance. You also have the personal leave rights which will kick in uh, in the case of the need for sick leave. Um, they are modified by the minimum employment standards embodied in modern awards and you'd need to be fully across modification of that area within your awards uh, or if you have enterprise agreements uh, across any specific provisions there. One area that comes into play here is that of stand down and under section 524.1c of the Fair Work Act there is a right to stand down employees where there is a stoppage of work for which the employer cannot reasonably be held responsible. Now there are issues as to whether that would kick in uh, in the case of uh, this sort of pandemic, but it's our view that if, uh, as is potentially the case in the coming weeks, the business could not practically uh, maintain its workforce due to the superimposed intervention of this coronavirus, um, there's a strong argument, we believe, to stand down employees. The difficulty is that that's a rather blunt instrument um, if you have to go from full compliance with your reward obligations, except, for example, to a total stand down where the employee would be significantly marginalised. And there is this issue in change management around the fair mutual transition, uh, whereby if you're going to try and assist your business deal with the exigencies of a challenge, that's all very well, but you need to also assist employees or those otherwise associated with your business to equally make that transition. Um, now, you would have seen Qantas reducing 30% across its senior workforce, but of course that would be in above award areas. And there's certainly things you can do as this virus impacts to impact reductions through fair change management to above award pay, uh, although you'd have to be extremely careful in doing so. But part of the difficulty with the current workplace relations system is that there's no flexibility to go below the safety net. And arguably there's a need for the convening of the Fair Work Commission president uh, of the industrial parties to try and look at modifying modern award safety net in the circumstances. Alternatively, for Christian Porter as the federal minister who already last week, as you will have seen, convened the major industrial parties to expedite legislation, allowing for greater flexibility. Otherwise, it's just too much of a jump and too harsh an impact uh, moving from full pay to stand down. Now that's an issue that will play out in due course. Now look, item four there, obviously you'll be auditing your contractual arrangements. There's no implied contractual right to stand down, but some of you might have it expressly. You obviously have implied contractual rights around safety but you also have a right to give reasonable directions under contracts of employment in the interest of safety. And one thing we're certainly recommending is that if we look at item six being privacy obligations, you wouldn't normally be entitled to understand not only the, all the health conditions attaching to one of your employees, but to their family, to their travel plans, to the travel movements of their family, uh, to their contact with anyone coming into uh, contact with this virus. If you haven't already, you should be ex exercising your right to issue reasonable directions in writing to compel the production to you of written information on all those issues, because as you'd be aware more than anyone, you can only risk manage if you have adequate information available to you. 
Now, you'll have your own business policy and procedures to deal with. Some of you might have an infectious disease policy. Others of you may need to modify your policy, some of which will be incorporated in contract. Uh, and you need to give that also some attention as part of your audit. Uh, and of course, privacy, I've mentioned the balance, but generally safety will prevail over privacy rights. Now, item three on the agenda, just moving to the next, uh, is just trying to look at the reciprocal uh, and given time limitations and uh, the limited time we have available for the webinar, I'm just going to very briefly look in through the next slide. And again, it's that breakdown of obligations at the reciprocal obligations and responsibilities of employees. Now, they have extensive rights, obviously, uh, but under work health and safety legislation, they also have a duty to look out for themselves and for everyone, again, at the workplace. Uh, and they have obligations to comply with reasonable directions in the interests of safety. So whilst they have their discrimination and general protection rights that you need to keep in balance, uh, there is a need for employees to fit in. And as I'll come to in the risk management area, we need to be reminding people of not only their rights, but also their responsibilities. The other uh, area I just wanted to touch on was contractors, obviously, Many of you will have contractual provisions dealing uh, with your contractors that give you rights in relation to safety obligations and directions. Uh, a simple example of where you might want to consult and modify would be um, your security measures on accessing your site. You might want to give yourself additional powers dealing with site movements in, in the wake of the coronavirus. Um, that would be one example of dealing with people through a modification to your signing procedures, for example. Um, you'd probably all be consulting with your IT contractors if you have them around working from home uh, with your cleaning contractors or building managers in terms of, or property managers in terms of cleanliness and hygiene. Um, and obviously you need to audit every one of your interactions and make sure that you've addressed it in context of potential risk interactions uh, around this virus. Obviously, if you've got someone at a back dock interacting regularly with a truckie, you need to understand from that trucking contractor what steps it's taken and if the steps are not adequate, you might modify your arrangements or try and use your contractual force or commercial negotiation to get in place appropriate adjustments. Now, against that background, a very awkward to quick survey of some risk. We'll just go to the next slide. Uh, which is developing a risk management plan. And uh, we certainly assume that all of you with your specialisation are already far ahead of this uh, and would have your own models. But again, this is just food for thought. And we're going to look at two areas, obviously prevention and reaction in the area of this risk. And so if we just go to the next slide, prevention of course is the preventing the spread of the virus and reaction is to the extent um, you're coming to an incident area uh, trying to control that incident. And just looking at this area of risk management uh, in the space of prevention, uh, obviously corporate commitment and leadership top down is absolutely vital. And given this is so critical, I'm not assuming any of you would be having resistance from your leadership. Although uh, even last week we were advising businesses on how best to communicate and some of them seem to be well behind in taking that leadership lead. So you really need to have your top level management committed uh, and endorsing of your program, uh, which should be integrated across all aspects of the business, including your interaction with all others. Secondly, people commitment and business culture. This is really the bottom up approach and making it part of the lifeblood of the business that you'd all be familiar with. And there's a big aspect of people management and inf information management in this component. Essentially, you should be integrating into your business plan in dealing with this coronavirus. And indeed, you should be revising your whole business plan around it. Um, that does involve a large degree of consultation from the bottom up. Uh, we're encouraging audits down to a micro audit of every single individual and uh, all aspects of their understanding of their contact with others and uh, their own personal risks. Uh, and obviously business has a big role to play in assisting individuals in conducting that audit and in looking out for themselves and that in turn will look after the business. But at a business level, uh, we need to integrate this not only into our business planning, but into job specifications, performance appraisals. There needs to be links to uh, remuneration and incentivation 
So revising KPIs, revising bonus terms, uh, and of course, make it part of induction, supervision, training on your site, behavior modification and disciplinary process, uh, where of course, one would hope there's a level of compassion, given we're all struggling to deal with this, but there is also no room for slackness, um, given that you could create that weak link that could infect a lot of people at your workplace. And so having that aligned integration into your existing procedures and adjusting them and announcing that and helping it change manage it is quite critical. Item three, allocation of responsibility. You want a clear line of responsibility just as you do in work health and safety generally across all the areas impacted by this virus. Item four, you need to help your people understand their legal obligations and their rights in the circumstances. Uh, item five, of course, your bread and butter, risk identification, analysis, assessment and prioritisation, leading to the introduction of controls. And as I said in the introduction, we're going to take the 10 questions as looking at some risks that you're dealing with and some controls that are being put in place by employers. Item seven is, of course, supervision, training and enforcement, making it part of something that just doesn't sit on the shelf but is actively enforced. Uh, and you'd all be aware that some of the major accidents and fatalities that we all deal with, unfortunately, from time to time, come from excellent, uh, I guess, paper systems, if I can call them that, that are not actively supervised, trained and enforced uh, at the workplace level. And we really need to take that seriously here and ensure that your entire management and supervisory level have that drilled in and have the proper links to their incentives, etc to take this extremely seriously. Uh, and again, monitoring and reviewing. Uh, you can see how rapidly this is moving. Uh, you should be uh, daily adjusting your risk management in relation to this issue. We'll then move just very briefly to reaction, reacting to potential impacts of the virus. Uh, you'll have specific incident response plans. Uh, obviously, internal reporting um, needs to be reviewed on how it's going to operate in relation to this virus. Uh, external reports, which beyond the Department of Health uh, might inc include the Safe Work Authority, um, if uh, the relevant incident um, emerges through an individual taking on uh, infection through contact with your business. Uh, normal internal investigation procedures on top of any external investigation, because you need to put in place, obviously, steps to prevent recurrence. Um, revisit your entire preventive model where it went wrong and make sure if it happens at the back dock between a truckie and a, a warehouseman uh, that you don't get repetition of that. Um, item seven, risk transfer. Again, you'd all be familiar with. Uh, this can be contractual provisions or often insurance. Uh, no doubt you're all um, auditing your contract force majeure clauses that might impact on supply chain issues with the impact of the virus. Uh, and no doubt employees are interested, not only uh, around knowing that there's business continuity insurance or otherwise, but at their micro level, uh, the fact that if they incur the virus through your workplace, there, there would be workers' comp kicking in. Um, we have salary continuance insurance, but it kicks in after a set period, normally around 90 days, uh, and may not be all that helpful with what seems to be the incubation period and duration of this virus's impact. Uh, and again, you need to be monitoring and reviewing and strengthening your incident response. Now, again, uh, I'd expect nothing much of information for many of you, but again, uh, just interesting to uh, pass through risk management against this virus. And with all the measures that you'd be putting in place, we obviously come then to another important area of uh, management is uh, change management. So change managing the introduction of the changes necessary. And here we have, we go to the next slide, uh, obviously the issue of clarity around what are your business objectives in the circumstances, coming up with a change action plan and implementation schedule, no doubt Gantt charts and other things which would be regularly modified. Um, telegraphing that to your people through a very clear communication strategy so that they can make the journey with you. Uh, we do have in Australia a very rich series of change management principles emerging from the Fair Work Commission and its predecessors. The notion is basically that you will be able to make change as rapidly as you need to to meet the 
uh, commercial contingency facing the business or the threat, uh, and you'll be supported in that, provided that you do take commensurate measures which are not unfair to employees. And so that's where notice, consultation, phased implementation, counselling around employees, helping them make the change, helping them get support in making financial adjustments or their own mental health adjustments uh, are quite critical as part of change management of this issue. Now, consultation, I'll mention yet again, there's a major full bench decision shortly after the Second World War that made the very simple point uh, that no matter how good a manager you are, you will never anticipate fully how an individual is going to be impacted by a particular set of management measures unless you actually ask them. And so consultation here is not just the top down dropping and asking for reaction. I really would encourage you to drill down and as I'll talk about later, we're doing employee by employee interviews and micro audits to assist us in managing the situation. In terms of proactive utilisation of rights in the industrial framework, I mentioned before the Qantas example of 30% in above award, but I had correspondence last Saturday week from a business operating in Asia, which was making it 30% across their entire workforce, and that was just phase one. And the aim is that rather than standing down totally some 30%, they're spreading the wear. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, many of you could do that in above award arrangements or award free uh, areas of your business, but you'd run into a lack of flexibility in your award and enterprise agreement employees and there's a need for that to be further addressed by either the legislature or the Fair Work Commission. So look, that's uh, an all too uh, brief survey of some issues. Again, just food for thought. Now we'll just go to the next slide. And it's at this point that, um, again, just moving on, that we're just going to revisit the area that the LME Global identified as the top 10 questions for employers uh, across the globe. And I'll throw to Maddie and Zeb, just remembering those 10 questions uh, and moving to the first one now, uh, I'll ask Maddie to start to take us through it. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Michael. As Michael mentioned, Zeb and I are planning to go through some of the most frequently asked questions about coronavirus as identified by our l &E Global Partners. So given the time, let's get stuck into it. Question one, how should employers handle international travel? So this is a good question because global travel has become a major issue for the containment of the novel coronavirus. And as you know, in just a few months, the virus has rapidly spread to nearly every country across the globe. So what are employees doing to manage this risk? Well, the way that employees are managing the risk and international travel in particular is constantly changing. As you are no doubt aware, many employees have already made the proactive decision to cease all international business related travel. And some organisations have even extended this ban to to domestic travel as well. Now, this measure is intended to prevent all staff from traveling to countries where the coronavirus is a major threat, but also spending time in public places such as on airplanes and at airports, where the, the risk of infection is greater. As you are probably aware, over the weekend, the Australian government directed all Australians to reconsider non-essential travel and to start practicing social distancing. Now, in light of this new guidance, we consider that the best practice option would be to immediately cease all work-related travel until further notice. And in doing so, you can encourage your staff to use other methods such as conference calls or virtual meetings or webinars such as this one uh, to avoid, I guess, unnecessary travel or um, movements to locations where the risk of infection is greater. Now, prior to this weekend, some businesses were still allowing travel to certain countries where there wasn't considered a high risk of infection. However, as mentioned, this is no longer recommended. And uh, this is because should your employees contract the virus while traveling, you may be subject to claims such as workers' compensation claims, or you may be put in a situation where your staff are unable to return to Australia due to lockdowns overseas which uh, are being introduced to late notice. Now that's our advice for the moment. However, going forward, once the immediate ban on travel has been relaxed by the government, 
We encourage you to reflect on your policies and procedures to ensure that you have special measures in place going forward. So you can see from the slide there that we've mentioned some measures which you may want to consider, including requiring that employees who develop symptoms such as a fever or cough refrain from travelling. Um, secondly, ensuring that staff are covered by appropriate travel insurance and that, and that that insurance would still apply given any recommendations from the government at the time. Uh, supply your staff with any protective equipment such as masks, hand sanitizer, and maybe even toilet paper given the recent events. Um, and create an action plan in the event of illness. So, if, so make sure your employees know who they need to contact and where they need to go if they do become unwell while traveling. Now, if we look at the next slide, um, in terms of personal travel, although employees do not have, usually have a say in where their staff travel in their free time, you do need to be informed about where your, your staff are going so that any potential risk of infection can be managed. So we do suggest that businesses consider introducing a specific travel related policy to deal with the coronavirus outbreak. And we've listed on the slide there some options that you may want to consider implementing, such as requiring the staff to provide HR with an itinerary before they go overseas, re requiring staff to confirm where they have traveled once they've returned, and requiring that staff remain away from the office for 14 days once they've returned from overseas, given the recent advice from the government. Following that, um, while staff are staying at home, you can require them to work from home where it's safe to do so, or consult with your staff about the best way to work around the incubation period. And we'll talk in a bit more detail about some of these aspects later in the webinar, but for the moment, I'll hand over to you, Zeb. Thanks, Maddie. Another frequently asked question, and understandably so, is who presents a risk in the workplace, even if they are asymptomatic? So put simply, anyone that has coronavirus and comes in contact with your workplace presents a risk. This would most likely be employees, but could also be contractors or clients who enter the office, especially as transmission appears relatively easy. As Michael discussed, businesses have a duty under the Work Health and Safety Act to control risks in the workplace from wherever they arise. For the coronavirus, Businesses must ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, that employees are not exposed to coronavirus. At the same time, employees and other persons in, at the workplace under the Act must take reasonable care for their own health and safety and reasonable care that their acts or omissions do not cause coronavirus spread and adversely affect the health and safety of others. Now, the most obvious risks are symptomatic individuals or those who have fever, a dry cough, and trouble breathing. This is only the most obvious risk though, as coronavirus can be spread by asymptomatic carriers. The incubation period, or the time between being exposed and having symptoms, is five days on average, but can be 14 days. So an employee, contractor, or client of a business can carry the virus and spread it for 14 days before symptoms arise. During this incubation period, the risk of asymptomatic spread is significant for people who have traveled through mainland China, Iran, Italy, or South Korea. But as noted by Maddy, the government yesterday to control the spread announced that all overseas arrivals will require a quarantine period. If employees have traveled overseas at all in the past 14 days, they should isolate themselves and self-monitor for symptoms for the duration of the incubation period. Another high risk are those exposed to local clusters of coronavirus or enclosed spaces where coronavirus has been confirmed, or even more risky, a confirmed case of coronavirus. It may be necessary to get information about employees' level of contact, for example, with Epping Boys High School, Ride Hospital, Macquarie University, or any other confirmed coronavirus locations. If regular visitors to your workplace have close contact with those places or any individual confirmed cases, they may also need to undergo isolation procedures. Employers, 
should be continually checking the status of other countries as a risk of coronavirus spread, uh, as well as local cost clusters and making sure that employees self-report their proximity to enable risk control steps to be taken. Thanks, Zeb. Okay, question three. Should employees with recent travel to China stay home? So the short answer to this question is yes, especially given that the current travel advice for China from the Australian government is at its highest rating, being do not travel to the region. Now, this is also the case for Iran, which Zeb mentioned earlier. And with this in mind, as well as your work health safety obligations, employees should take all necessary steps to prevent any employees who have recently travelled to any of these countries from attending the office for the duration of the incubation period. Now, as we've mentioned a bit earlier, given the recent advice from the Australian government, you also need to encourage any staff member who has returned from overseas trips to any country to self-isolate for 14 days. Now, at present, New South Wales Health advises that the incubation period for coronavirus can be up to two weeks. However, again, given how rapidly things are changing in this area, you do need to monitor if the advice in this regard does change. So, in requiring your staff to remain at home, you do need to consider a number of factors. Number one, whether or not you have a contractual right to require the employee to remain at home. Number two, whether the employer has a right under an award or enterprise agreement to require the employee to remain at home. Or three, whether the employer can give a lawful and reasonable direction for the employee to remain at home. Now, let's discuss reasonable and lawful directions in a bit more detail. As the name suggests, a lawful and reasonable direction needs to meet two criteria. It needs to be lawful and reasonable. Now, it's our assessment that a direction which is necessary for the work health and safety of all other staff is likely to be considered lawful. However, the question of whether or not a direction is reasonable is more complex and it depends on the facts and circumstances of each case. Now, these are things which you'll need to consider when deciding whether or not you can direct your staff to take special paid leave, work from home if it's safe to do so, perform alternate duties, or where all other leave entitlements have been exhausted, take annual leave pursuant to Section 94 of the Fair Work Act. Now, these are all complex considerations which need to be carefully managed and set out in your organisation's risk management plan. And it, and it is important that employees consult with their staff about any changes to policies or procedures and consider the applicability of your awards and enterprise ag agreements before taking any action. Thanks, Maddie. So along with overseas travel then, another significant risk is where an employee has a family member at home with COVID-19. So person-to-person -person spread generally occurs between close contacts or someone who has been face-to-face -face for at least 15 minutes or in the same closed space for at least two hours with an infected person. If a family member at home has coronavirus then, there is a high risk that the employee themselves has been exposed. Once infection of a family member at home is confirmed, according to New South Wales Health, best practice is for that employee to isolate themselves at home for 14 days after contact with the infected person and monitor symptoms. This employee would then only return to the workplace following the receipt of a medical certificate that clears them of the virus. If the employee has already returned to the office, but before discovering their family member's diagnosis, this will be a bit more difficult for the business. Best practice would be to apply quarantine measures to all employees that could have interacted with that employee. This could include employees on the same floor or all employees, taking the same 14-day isolation measures, depending on the level of contact that occurs within the business. The business would also need to consider informing clients or contractors. In one instructive example mentioned by Michael earlier, the Sydney office of law firm Clayton Oots was evacuated around a week and a half ago and asked to work from home after a staff member flagged that they may have been indirectly exposed. 
the decision was made after the 95-year-old grandmother of the staff member's wife contacted, contracted the disease at an aged care facility. That was enough to send 600 employees home until testing was done. When the staff member and their wife had their results come back negative, the result of the, the rest of the office though, were, were able to return. In a recent development though, a second te test of the employee's wife after she developed flu-like symptoms last weekend tested positive uh, last Monday. This second test did not require another evacuation because the employee had not returned to the office, underlining the need for self-isolation during the incubation period. So this example also demonstrates that managing the risk of coronavirus requires employees to disclose symptoms or contact freely and without fear of any adverse action from the business so that the rest of the workforce can be protected. The emphasis to employees should be on their safety and this attitude will ultimately benefit the bottom line of the business. Thanks, Sam. Okay, question five. Do employers have to pay employees who are away from work due to concerns of exposure? So this question is likely to arise in two situations. Firstly, if an employee is unwell because of recent exposure, that employee can take personal leave in the ordinary way. And, it, and if that leave is exhausted, then there's no need to pay that employee going forward. However, in other circumstances, when the employer directs an employee to stay away from the office, consideration needs to be given to a couple of things, a few which I mentioned earlier in the, in the webinar. So firstly, whether the employee's contract of employment, award or enterprise agreement provides a clause allowing for the employer a right to stand down the employee without pay. Secondly, where the contract or agreement is silent on the issue, you can, sit, you can consider whether you have a right to stand down under Section 524 of the Fair Work Act. And thirdly, failing the above, you should consider whether you can give an employee a reasonable and lawful direction to stand down without pay. Now, the stand down provisions in the Fair Work Act state that an employee may be stood down without pay in certain circumstances. And most relevantly, subsection C states that the employer has a right to stand down where there is a stoppage of work for any cause for which the employer cannot reasonably be held responsible. Now, these provisions appear to only relate to emergency situations where there is a genuine stoppage of work and not just a mere reduction. And case law suggests that employer will not be held responsible where the stoppage was caused by an exceptional or unexpected event. For example, the explanatory memorandum refers to a scenario where the office is impacted by flash flooding. However, unfortunately, there has not been any specific consideration of these provisions in the context of a coronavirus or infectious disease outbreak. So we suggest that you carefully consider whether or not these provisions apply to your particular circumstances and seek some legal advice prior to relying on any of these clauses. Separately, in terms of lawful and reasonable directions, as I mentioned earlier, the notion of lawful and reasonable directions in the context of requiring staff to remain at home requires consideration of whether or not the direction is lawful and reasonable. Now, the same test applies to standing down employees without pay. However, you will need to carefully consider whether it would, would be considered reasonable to stand someone down without paying that employee in circumstances where you're directing them to do so to protect the work health and safety of other staff members. Now, the risk of standing down an employee without the right to do so is that employees could face claims about breach of contract, potentially adverse action or discrimination. And given these potential legal issues that may arise, we recommend that employees seek appropriate legal advice before taking any action in this regard. In answer to our next frequently asked question, what steps should employers require before allowing employees to return to work? The response really depends on the particular case and the risk factors that are present. 
As an overarching reminder though, any economic benefits of an employee's return should be weighed against the significant penalties in the Work Health and Safety Act, which include $500,000 for, for a business's failure to comply with a health and safety duty, $1.5 million where the failure exposes an individual to a risk of death or serious injury, and $3 million where the failure is accompanied by recklessness as to the risk of death or serious injury. If the business fails to provide a work environment free of foreseeable risks of coronavirus spread, the employer, as well as any accessories to lax procedures in the senior management and governance team, could be liable. Against this backdrop then, employers should require that an employee isolate themselves for 14 days from the date of any potential coronavirus exposure. During that 14 days, employees should monitor for symptoms and if these do not present within the 14 days, the individual should be able to return to work. Employees should honestly represent their travel plans and any possible coronavirus contact. An employer, though, would be best placed to seek such information through a lawful and reasonable direction. And failure to provide this information, which would be necessary to manage safety risks in the workplace, would be a legitimate cause for disciplinary action. If serious risk factors are present, particularly any symptoms, the employer should insist on a medical certificate clearing the employee of coronavirus. This would also be a reasonable and lawful direction given the implied duty of each contract and the express work health and safety duties to maintain a safe workplace. In terms of a confirmed sufferer of the coronavirus, the infection period will vary from person to person. Before these individuals return from work though, there will need to be additional medical clearances. It is possible for the coronavirus to stay in the body for weeks after symptoms of the disease clear up. This could mean that even if the individual feels fine after the 14 days, they would still be able to transmit coronavirus to others. Before they are released from self isolation and return to the workplace, they really would need tests to confirm that they can no longer spread coronavirus. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so question seven, what communication steps should an employer take if an employee has contracted COVID-19? So if one of your staff members has contracted the virus, consideration needs to be given to what information needs to be passed on to other staff members for their own health and safety, as well as any privacy obligations that you owe to the infected person. Now, this communication needs to firstly be clear and done in a way that relays the information without creating panic or hysteria. And secondly, it needs to inform the staff of the risk and how the risk can be managed. But the communication does not need to disclose the individual's name who has contracted the virus in order to protect some level of confidentiality. Now, apart from the internal communication, you need to give. You should also consider whether it's appropriate to notify stakeholders such as clients and contractors about their potential exposure to the virus and also consider whether or not you have an obligation to notify New South Wales Health as well as the relevant work health and safety regulator. In making such a communication you also need to ensure that you're aware of any competing obligations under the Privacy Act. However it does appear that there are relevant exemptions particularly under Section 7B3 of the Privacy Act. However, again, this is something which you may wish to consider obtaining specialist advice in relation to before taking any action. Thanks, Maddie. So we now move to the more, more dire scenarios and question eight, what steps should an employer take if an employee or customer slash client is confirmed to have coronavirus after being in the workplace? So for the individual affected, the employer must immediately send that employee or client home for self-isolation until they no longer risk spreading the virus. In terms of business operations, there are options for working from home, personal leave, including negative leave options, directions to take annual leave, and as a last resort, employee stand downs. 
It is important to remember that adverse action cannot be taken against those that come forward with symptoms or exposure to coronavirus. Not only will this lessen the possibility that others will report and enable prevention measures, but any adverse action taken could be a form of disability discrimination if it was not strictly necessary to protect public health or a breach of the general protections to exercise a workplace right to control safety risks to others under the Work Health and Safety Act. In terms of the broader workplace, an employer must communicate workplace health and safety risks. While privacy concerns are important, in these circumstances, an employer's work health and safety duties to inform at-risk parties would prevail. The Privacy Act notably exempts private sector employees handling an em sorry, private sector employers handling an employee's personal information for a purpose directly related to the employment relationship. Accordingly, if disclosure of a coronavirus diagnosis was related to the employment relationship as required to prevent spread to other employees, the employer would be protected from confidentiality requirements. This means that the business should inform all other clients, contractors, and other employees who may have been in contact with a confirmed case of coronavirus. The employer should then try to confirm the genesis of the infection, particularly whether this was a client or contractor to determine its spread. The business will need to confirm which client, contractor or other employee had close contact with the person or exposure to their work spaces. These parties will need to undergo isolation procedures themselves until testing confirms that they also do not have coronavirus. In these circumstances, the business should be overcautious about who could have been exposed. At the same time, if the confirmed coronavirus infection was to arise out of the workplace or be connected to the workplace, the business would have to notify medical authorities and Safe Work New South Wales. Finally, the office should be comprehensively clean to ensure that employees cannot catch coronaviruses, sorry, coronavirus from any surfaces upon their return. Thanks, Meb. Okay, question nine. Are there steps employers should take now to help reduce the spread of coronavirus in the workplace? So, as Michael mentioned, the first step that employees need to take is that they need to have a risk management strategy in place which is reflective of the current advice from the Australian government and clearly communicated to all staff. Now, as part of this strategy, employees should consider introducing measures that reduce the spread of the virus in the workplace, such as requiring that meetings occur via teleconference or Skype and have measures in place which reduce handshaking, such as the respectful bow, which Harmers has introduced as a way of greeting clients. Uh, separately, have staff remind staff of the need to maintain personal hygiene by washing their hands, avoiding touching their face and practicing certain practices when coughing and sneezing by doing so into a tissue. Uh, encouraging staff when they're unwell to not attend the office and reducing the time spent on public transport. So Harmers is considering the prospect of staggering work hours for those employees who spend a long time on public transport. You should also consider developing a crisis plan if the situation worsens. So be prepared for an escalation of the situation and whether or not you need to make changes to your policies and contracts if things do change rapidly. And lastly, implement a policy whereby the failure to comply with any of the requirements to minimise the risk of coronavirus results in disciplinary action or a reduction in bonuses and incentives. And this is merely a way of encouraging compliance by all your staff, although it does have some sensitivities in terms of potential discrimination and adverse action, which you'll need to carefully weigh. Now, not only will thinking ahead be valuable for managing the current threat of the virus, but also any similar outbreaks which may arise in coming years. Thanks, Maddie. 
Now, in terms of thinking ahead, uh, I'll now look at the important final question. What pandemic planning steps should employee, employers consider to be able to continue to operate their business in the event of further potential community outbreaks? Now, as Michael emphasised, and not to belabor the point, but the climate is changing and a recognised effect of that is viral outbreaks will become more frequent. Coronavirus has been tremendously disruptive, but businesses, businesses will need to consider how to cope with similar pandemics in the future. From a practical perspective, technological capacity is key. According to the most recent Australian Bureau of Statistics data, almost a third of employed people regularly work from home in their main job or business. These numbers will skyrocket during pandemics and businesses will need remote logins and teleconference capabilities to ensure widespread sustained work from home. During a sufficiently serious virus, it is possible that employers could endanger their employees by asking them to use public transport and wade through a crowded CBD just to sit at air conditioned offices alongside several of their co co-workers. Another practical step is to establish a risk contingency team to coordinate business continuity plans with clear lines of communication among management positions. Part of this plan should include standards and procedures for inter-office consultation. Developing such a plan will enable employers to respond to pandemics or other emergencies much quicker. Businesses may also consider how behavioural incentives can assist in risk management, and this was mentioned by Maddie. In these circumstances, work, work safety compliance during pandemics could be added to KPIs or bonus schemes, and businesses may also need to consider whether a culture of presenteeism uh, could cause work health and safety issues to fall by the wayside. Um, when a pandemic occurs. From a legal perspective, employers must consider whether they could arrange for stand downs as a last resort. As Maddie also covered, there is considerable uncertainty over whether the Fair Work Act allows for businesses to stand down employees without pay, as the distinct question of pandemics has not been tested by the Fair Work, uh, the Fair Work uh, commission. Until this is clarified, we would suggest that you seek legal advice on the drafting of contracts or enterprise agreements to provide for stand downs for future pandemics. So these legal and, and practical measures are just some of the most important steps to enable businesses, business continuity in the event of future pandemics. All right, look, now we'll go through an all too brief case study and just uh, give some indications of some of the things we're doing and it will be very brief because we do want to get on to and answer some of your questions. So if we just go back to the relevant risk management model, uh, just looking at some of the preventive steps that we're taking, certainly in terms of corporate commitment and leadership, I've made a point of leading communication on this throughout the firm, including a number of full firm voicemails and things of that nature. And as I mentioned before, it should be well and truly strongly imprinted by uh, leaders within your business. Secondly, in terms of people commitment and business culture, uh, we have arranged for one-on-one -on -one interviews with all of our staff to develop a demographic so that in planning, for example, to move from working from home, we can look at staggering hours um, to assist some people with pet transport needs or introducing working from home with those who have the greatest exposure to public transport. Uh, we've also been encouraging our staff to do that micro audit, uh, whereby they look at themselves and their standard day and all areas of exposure to help us help them, if you like. Thirdly, around allocation responsibility, we've formed a project team which has uh, the majority of our executive committee on it so that we can actually make decisions in that one body. We have no second sign-off and that just means we can get things moving very quickly. And that entity uh, met three times last week uh, and they'll again meet tomorrow uh, as this plays out day by day. And we're all, of course, communicating around this and making decisions on a daily basis. 
Fourthly, understanding legal obligations and opportunities. We displaced our normal training syllabus last week that we conduct every week with a training session on this area uh, and use that to further consult in the space. Fifthly, in terms of risk identification, analysis, assessment and prioritisation, uh, to a large extent that's mirroring the sort of things that um, Seb and Maddie have taken you through. Um, at seven, we certainly are briefing our team leaders and will reinforce it again in a team leader meeting tomorrow on the need to supervise and actively enforce this. And again, the project team is actively monitoring and reviewing. Now, just by way of some examples of steps we're taking, uh, as you're all no doubt doing, we're issuing to our staff the standard information coming from the World Health Organisation, the Department of Health, um, the Safe Work Australia in relation to some aspects of guidance. Uh, also, if I can just flip forward to um, two slides. Um, another one, thanks. Um, we've put a lot of signage up around our firm in recent weeks. Uh, no doubt, again, all, you're all familiar with those. Um, guidance on, uh, I guess, symptoms, coughing, personal hygiene, uh, all of those other than the second one, which is our respectful bow, um, uh, we took off public sources, so they're all available to you. Um, in terms of the respectful bow, we don't get that close, but we couldn't fit, fit it in the picture otherwise. So we're not doing a headbutt, but um, more opposite a boardroom table, so a long distance apart. Um, uh, so signage is very important, along with other information. Uh, obviously, we've introduced travel restrictions, even our, our morning tea, we've got guidelines now, no personal handling of food other than true implements, and we've changed the nature of what we have so that it's more food that people don't handle with their hands in preparation or in consumption. Uh, I've mentioned the one-on-one -on -one consultation with management in our firm, managing by working around and getting a demographic of our staff for a whole range of risk management measures and we're developing a more detailed questionnaire around that personal audit. Um, consultation, we've already conducted with our IT contractor, with our uh, building manager, and with, for example, our planning contractor and a range of other interface entities. Uh, we've mentioned restrictions on uh, direct face-to-face -face, uh, with emphasis on Skype or video conference or teleconference. Uh, obviously guidance on what to do if people get ill. Uh, we've also issued those directions around requiring uh, in writing that all our employees provide us with full information on their own health, their family members' health, on their own travel plans, family members' travel plans, and a requirement to put forward information on any contact whatsoever with someone who's come in touch with the virus, just so we can again have information to allow us to make decisions. And look, even over the weekend, we had to make three decisions on staff members on whether they work from home or not. And in fact, three of them are at the moment, just in more abundant caution um, as a result of issues that came up. Um, we have introduced our own uh, calibration point around all of this. Uh, I, I find the three symptoms, the uh, fever, the shortness of breath and the cough, uh, we've calibrated them in that order. We are requiring fever as a... Um, a mandatory component before we send someone home. Uh, we're not going to be sending people home for a cough or cold cure, um, although we're certainly seeking um, ongoing guidance around all of this. But coming into the Australian winter, we certainly can't utilise a cold, for example, as a um, satisfactory symptom for that sort of move. And I'd encourage you all to work on your own calibration points. Um, we've got extensive consultation going on around our work from home arrangements. Um, staggered working hours is something that we've already introduced for some staff members. Uh, and uh, in terms of material issued staff, apart from tissue, we've got no touch bins, hand sanitizers. We're issuing thermometers to every staff member to encourage self monitoring um, with help from the workplace, antiseptic wipes. Face masks, not for protection, but only if someone becomes ill, so they don't infect others on the way home, that sort of thing. Um, and on-site health checks, um, we're arranging for all our staff, uh, rather than having them necessarily visit medical centres. Um, 
So look, that's just a small touch on a large number of things we're doing, and no doubt you're doing a lot of things too. So let's, without further ado, uh, move to some of your questions, and uh, just been handed a list of them, so we'll try and move through them at um, warp speed. Uh, what is the recovery rate in terms of time? Look, that is dependent on case to case, and as Zeb mentioned, uh, some people have had health sign off and um, then later on develop symptoms. Others can carry the uh, virus for many weeks, even though they might go asymptomatic after a period of time. And that's why uh, we and I think a lot of employers are assisting on a, a strict medical sign off and test. Uh, and we've already had that applied to uh, our staff members. Um, and even with that test, uh, they were cleared of the coronavirus, but the medical professional concerned has indicated that they shouldn't still return to work because they're still carrying some symptoms and we're complying with that medical guidance. So put yourself in the hands of a specialist because it is case by case. It's not an averaging or a general issue. It, it's a specialist sign off. Um, graphs display on these headings. I'm not sure what exactly is meant there. Certainly signage is important. Um, uh, is there legislation that applies to government mandates? Look, you're probably all familiar with the fact that there is a Biosecurity Act Commonwealth that was introduced around 2015 for this, just this sort of issue that gives extensive powers to the federal government and to the police to enforce measures designed to ensure public health. And there's complementary state legislation, for example, to enforce the isolation issues post travel that are in place at the moment. Now, look, there's a myriad of legislation, I won't go through it all, but there certainly is um, legislation backing the government directives. Um, given the requirement to report to the regulator for GP says the person needs to be off for 10 days from the date of injury in WA at least, do we need to report these cases if we think we caught it uh, at work? Uh, certainly yes. Uh, as I mentioned on the way through, if the workplace has contributed, um, you need to treat it as a normal safe working issue on top of other notifications you might make to the Department of Health or otherwise. Can you focus on the implication workers' comp if infections are contracted within the workplace? Uh, look, I won't dwell on it, but if it's picked up in the course of employment, uh, which is the standard phrase in workers' comp legislation, there are certainly implications in terms of potential workers' comp entitlement. Now, as normal, that'll be looked into and assessed by the insurer and could potentially be challenged by the employee if not granted. Where a worker is required to travel for essential work purposes within Australia, should business consider isolating from a period when upon return due to their potential exposure to the airport and whilst on the plane? Now look, this is a very good question. One of the anomalies with this current freeze out on people to self-isolate after international travel uh, is that I don't think it's been particularly thorough, up to date at least, in terms of connecting flights, where of course uh, in recent weeks people from international trips have been getting, um, going on to connecting flights. And even with this self-isolation, I don't know that it's abundantly clear that connecting flights are not still being utilised before people self-isolate at home. So that being the case, we are certainly encouraging um, that our staff not travel at all. Um, having said that, we have cases listed in the state. So if it's vital for work, we're doing it, but we're encouraging against it. Uh, and certainly, again, case by case, assess whether it's appropriate given the nature of the flight. Uh, and of course, if someone became symptomatic, you'd really swoop on that one. But at the moment, um, whilst it would be prudent to do so, there is no requirement that domestic travel um, carry the same self-isolation. Can a company, and look, we're coming up to time. Um, if I can just put this, and I'm very much in uh, Sarah's hands in terms of um, availability of the connection, but we're happy to keep on working through these questions. Some of you might need to get away because we're approaching 1.30 and I apologise for that, but we'll keep on working through the questions just so we can get through as many as possible and I'll, I'll leave it to the organisers as to when um, we, we, we knock off. I'm happy to wait as long as you you're, want to go on, Michael. So. Okay, look, that's very kind of you. And as I say, we won't be disappointed if people go about their business, but if you'd like to wait, we'll keep on working through. So can a company issue a policy advising employees that if they decide to travel overseas, they'll not be allowed to return to work for 14 days and will have to be on leave without pay during this period? Uh, look, you certainly could do that. Um, 
having said that, first of all, yes, you, you, you can and indeed should make it clear to your employees what your requirements are post international travel. The second part though, that they'll have to um, go on leave without pay, if it is their um, personal travel as opposed to business travel, uh, you will be more strongly placed for that. Um, however, um, if you're giving directions in the interests of the safety of your workforce and someone's ready, willing and able to work, um, normally you wouldn't be able to do that without pay. Now, that becomes a bit more interesting where they've got to self-isolate by government requirement. There would be an argument that that's getting to a point where you could stand them down um, and, and perhaps have them utilise sick leave if they are ill or potentially have it on leave without pay given that they go away with full knowledge of a government imposed, not employer imposed restriction. Uh, isolation on a mine site or remote workplace, would you send them home um, on leave uh, or I think leave them on site for the 14 days? Look again, that'll be a case by case assessment. I suggest that you'd uh, consult with the relevant uh, employee concerned and their family. I'll just give you an example. We've got uh, one of our staff members spouses returning from the United States yesterday. Now, you all would have been hearing about the last, one of the fatalities overnight in Australia from this virus was from someone who had contracted the disease from a relative who returned from the United States, which you know hasn't really been high on the list, if you like, although it's about number eight in the world for the number of cases. Um, we have discussed it with a staff member and it's been arranged for now that first for the first week, the staff member will isolate away from their family because it just seems a little bit pointless if they're going to self-isolate, but they're coming into regular contact with the family, which in turn comes in contact with workplaces and schools, etc. So that's dealt with that matter through consultation for the first week and we're going to monitor symptoms and assess and further discuss that. So. If you consulted with a staff member and it was thought that for the sake of not only that staff member that, but their family, that they could better self-isolate in a remote mine site or other aspect of work, may not be the most fantastic week or two the person's had, but it might be actually far better for a lot of people they otherwise interact with when they do their flying fly out, um, if you like. So case by case, by consent, you can do anything. Um, by reasonable direction, you can do a lot, but carefully consult and look at the exigencies of each case. How many lots of 14 days should an employer have to pay if the employee breaches the isolation period guidelines by going out in public or having visitors to their home? Can this then convert? They're using their own uh, sick or annual leave. Um, look, certainly that is something, again, you'd assess on a case-by-case -case basis. If employees are not being compliant with your directions, you're entitled to take disciplinary action. You might even say, look, uh, you brought this upon yourself, the need for this extended period, uh, we're going to put the cost on to you, but you have to be very careful in the manner in which you did that. Um, just going on to the next set of questions. If schools closed, does carers leave cover the time off an employee may need to take? The child isn't sick and given the fact that the possibility of school closures is now a known risk, does this satisfy the requirement that the person leave can be taken in an unexpected emergency? Look, I'd be inclined to consult with staff um, to utilise um, personal leave um, if they do, if these staff members do need to be away from work to look after um, individuals. Certainly that is something that's going to be a catalyst for work from home for a lot of people. Um, but if the individual simply cannot work from home and they have a need to be away, um, again, I'd be inclined myself to be meeting that cost initially. Um, but if it goes across the board, um, there's going to come a point where businesses simply can't afford to supplement these things and post utilisation of carers leave uh, is going to have to get to a point of stand down after a period of time if people need to be away from the workplace. But again, I'd encourage consultation and, and care around moving to that level. Um, then one person asks, I didn't find that information on medical certificates clear for when they're isolated for 14 days and display no symptoms over time. Can they return without a medical certificate clearance? Is that is a stack deck a good option here if medical certificate not required? Look, I'd still press for a medical sign-off. As I mentioned before, um, people can still have the virus even if they go asymptomatic. 
um, you need a health professional to say, I've tested, there is no virus. And in one case we've had with our own staff, even though they've tested and it's clear for the virus because they're still displaying some symptoms, the medical practitioner has recommended that they continue to self-isolate. So I'd err on the side of caution um, and certainly get the guidance from a health professional because this is so nuanced, it's very hard to call on a generalised basis. What are the employer rights to not have to continue to pay for isolation where the employer chooses to associate with someone who later suspected of having the virus? Therefore, the 14 days needs to start again. I think that's similar to that earlier question. If there is employee conduct during the 14 day period, which is contrary to your reasonable directions, uh, and they have through their own personal conduct brought on the need for further isolation, you'd be entitled to treat that as a disciplinary issue and potentially to insist that ongoing isolation uh, was without pay. They put it on themselves. It's not the employer's fault and, and they should, can and should be stood down potentially. Should the employer report to the relevant department of health employers are associated with someone confirmed with the virus breaches the isolation period? I certainly would uh, recommend you report that to the department of health. Um, and uh, if, again, it's a, an issue that's come out of your workplace, um, uh, bring in the Safe Work Authority for um, investigation. But if it's purely individual conduct out in the community by an employee who's breaching your uh, directions, that is a matter for the Department of Health and the authorities at the moment. Now, just going on to a further set of questions that have been handed. Would it be possible to share the micro-award format you requested uh, employees to conduct? Uh, look, we'll certainly um, try and get you some information on that. Um, please give, if I can just say this about that, um, again, when I go back to that consultation issue, there's a lot we don't know about employees and their standard day. If I look at um, staff in a city area, for example, we don't know what staff do during their lunchtime. Some do go to gym, some will go to restaurants. Uh, we need to understand the extent to which they're getting exposed in their private time. We need to understand their travel arrangements. We need to understand their personal life more if we're going to assess the risk that they present to the workplace. And it may even be reasonable to make uh, suggestions to them about their personal lifestyle. We're certainly passing on a lot of information to help people with that. Uh, so yes, I'd certainly encourage you to do that micro audit, even if it's as simple as asking people to set out that standard day and to give you an assessment of what they're doing to minimise their risk. Now you want to, might want to read. Uh, to intervene then in the interests of everyone at your workplace um, about their lifestyle. And again, that's something that would normally be private and not reasonable, but in this extreme circumstance, certainly reasonable and practicable and something I'd be encouraging you to do and we will send out more on that. Um, please give an overview on self-isolation. Look, given time, I uh, just note that there are government guidelines in self-isolation. I actually find the New Zealand government's guidelines more helpful here than the Australian government's. And so have a look at that. It's got a, a whole graduated series of steps around self-isolation and what that means, including what you do in your own health house to protect others in your household. So rather than repeat all of that, I, I'd refer you to those sources. It's worth mentioning only 1% of cases expected to have 14 day or more incubation period, maybe just five days. Businesses need to assess what's an appropriate level of risk to take by consulting health advice relating to their context. I uh, couldn't agree more, it is um, case by case. And as I mentioned before, um, get the assistance of uh, health expert, experts um, and certainly before people return to the workplace or have contact with people associated or with the workplace. Uh, and look, uh, going back to the earlier question on self-isolation and uh, the micro audit, it's certainly reasonable in my view to be giving directions not only about self-isolation but how they conduct themselves during that period because you don't want slackness unseen during that period uh, impacting your workplace and you need to be properly informed. So directions around all of that in writing are very important. Can employees be reasonably directed to take personal leave, sick annual RDOs? Look, in, in appropriate circumstances, you can direct the taking of annual leave. Um, in terms of sick leave, it does require people to be sick. In terms of roster days off, that will depend on the particular 
contractual award or enterprise agreement RDO system or any policy you have in place that relevant, is relevant to it. Um, but again, um, certainly audit your rights there and um, I would encourage you all to have available to you uh, a cascading series of how you're going to try and mitigate the impact on this of staff all the way to stand down and if necessary reductions in pay rather than stand down if you can affect that through fair change management. Uh, and as I've mentioned, there's a need for our system, I think, to uh, be subject to more flexibility in this extreme circumstance and watch this space in terms of whether the Minister federally or the Fair Work Commission convenes the parties around that issue. Uh, can you please confirm some of the ways questions you have used to consult with staff? I think I've mentioned the micro audit in terms of we're going to require that to be uh, put forward to us. We had um, one of our managers delegated um, specifically to walk around last week and do one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, specifically addressing issues of travel and working from home and things of that nature. That's been put in a table so that we have a demographic which our, uh, gives us information through which we're going to prioritise steps with our staff. And uh, again, uh, there's other things that you can do, but that's just some examples that we've been utilising. Hello, great seminar, thank you. How do you, um, probably out of line there, but there you go. How do we go about getting a copy of the detailed employee audit questionnaire? I've just, I think I mentioned that. We'll, we'll try and put something out for you. Uh, understand it's not yet finalised, but we're great to access once finalised. So we're, we're meeting again on that tomorrow, so hopefully we can get out something to you very soon. Uh, are you allowed to use domestic flights after flying to Australia internationally to get home? Should workers returning to Australia use a taxi to get home to, to start self-isolation? Um, on the latter, I'd certainly encourage that. And I think I mentioned the trouble with domestic flights. I don't understand there to be restrictions on connecting flights at the moment. And I do see that as a major shortfall in what's happening. Uh, that's not a criticism. I think this is all very difficult and the government's doing a great job in trying to I think really catch up, to be honest, on what other countries are doing. Um, but that still remains, I think, a bit of a shortfall. And I'd certainly be guarding against domestic flights and urging taxi travel wherever possible rather than other public transport if you have to use transport. Uh, next question. My organisation does a lot of interstate travel and travel within WA. What would be the recommendation for this type of travel? Um, I think we've touched on interstate travel, limited if you can and if um, uh, to be frank, if there's not restrictions introduced on uh, connecting flights and things like that, I'd really be um, encouraging you to limit interstate travel and to encourage use of phone and uh, uh, internet and other connection for uh, clients, etc., to the extent possible. Uh, with inter interstate travel, to the extent people can use their own car and then travel with a set of restrictions, I think that's also reasonable in the circumstances. How can we easily translate all this to small businesses so they can understand? Look, very good question, really difficult um, for small businesses. They don't have risk managers. They don't have the same wherewithal that a lot of uh, medium and larger businesses do. Um, so in that context, uh, I think it's really a matter of, for them of common sense. There is the material around and the signage. So they can all be recommending um, things around washing hands, not touching your face, limiting face-to-face -face communication. They can certainly introduce the basics, um, consistent with fairly public advice out there. Uh, and again, from sessions like this, hopefully just take some illustrative steps that they might be able to apply to their business, but I appreciate their resources are limited. And what's reasonably practicable for them may be far different to a, for what is in place for a large business. And look, that's the whole notion of reasonably practicable. Uh, it's that juxtaposition about the nature of the risk. And if the risk is high, then the, the cost that you have to endure to manage that risk and to minimise its potential impact in terms of time, money, effort has to be weighed up on an opposing scale. And if the risk is one of life and death such as this, it's only when the cost is significantly disproportionate that you be able to say you've taken all reasonably practical steps. Now that cost factor for a small business is going to be significantly different and they, they're entitled to factor that in taking some on the ground practical steps of the kind uh, that we've mentioned in this uh, webinar. 
uh, where would be a good source to obtain information on pandemic planning for workplaces? Look, uh, you'll find examples on the web. I, I find the Victorian government uh, uh, has a very good uh, pandemic guideline uh, for business. And so that's probably one of the better ones that I've seen, but you'll find many examples on the web. And if it comes from a reliable state government or federal government source, uh, I'd certainly suggest having regard to that, but try that Victorian resource first. Uh, if as an employer, uh, we'd hear to all directives given by the federal and state health departments, uh, would we not be compliant on the obligation of WHS regulations? Look, um, they're different obligations. Obviously the government is through the Biosecurity Act and otherwise equipping itself to impose things on the community. And yes, you should certainly calibrate to meet that requirement but complying just with what they put in place doesn't avoid you the requirement to audit your own obligations, the exigencies of your business, that devolution of responsibility to you is a big part of the structure of the work health and safety legislation under the model provision all the way back to the Robins inquiry. And you really need to be seen to be actively doing that. And if it's necessary for you to go far beyond what the government is doing to meet exigencies of health and safety in your business, then that's exactly what you need to do. Uh, so don't just go by the minimum requirements put in place by the government. That is the minimum for the community. Your obligation in safety is something separate that needs to be addressed based upon and tailored to the exigencies of your business. We're currently drafting an internal notice for our staff and contractors on the company's expectations and precautions being taken. We'd like to keep this simple, clear and concise. Any recommendations and specifics to be included or templates available from resources. Um, I, I've, I put up before just some of the signage that is available that you can utilise, but in terms of uh, standard directions and contract provisions, we'd be happy to help you with that. We certainly, as I say, issue directions to our staff, um, which we'd be happy to discuss with you. But again, it does need to be tailored, so I perhaps won't say more about that for now. Uh, what is the best way to remind an employee of cough, sneeze, etiquette while respecting privacy and not discriminating? Look, um, some of the signage I showed you before had some of that coloured. Um, so the manner in which you, you would cough or sneeze in the office. Uh, and I'd certainly encourage you to be getting that about. It's dealt with here through one-on-one -on -one consultation in our training session through signage and otherwise. Uh, there's many ways of getting it about. And I wouldn't be too coy uh, about privacy here. I, I understand and respect that all of this has to be done with great sensitivity, but we're talking about a crisis here and we need to take steps that might otherwise um, be considered out of line on a privacy front. Um, just coming to the, the last few questions now, in regards to consultation with the workforce, does not adhere to medical and government advice Come on the same ground as complying with legislative requirements does not require consultative on the New South Wales uh, regulations. Look, there's certainly arguments around that, but again, if you look at all reasonably practical steps to ensure safety, um, uh, certainly it is reasonable to consult and to garner information and to integrate. Uh, and indeed, I would suggest to you that remains a very important obligation. And of course, it's not just under the safety legislation, it's also under awards, all modern awards for change management around this have consultation obligations. So keep an eye not just on safety requirements, but also on industrial requirements. And I'd suggest you err strongly on the side of consultation uh, in this area. Um, certainly you're entitled to reflect and impose what's already imposed by government regulation. Um, but you're required to consult and go beyond it to meet the exigencies of your business uh, under both uh, employment, safety uh, and uh, industrial legislation. Um, if a family member has returned from overseas and therefore required to self-isolate, can the employer of anyone who shares a, uh, a home with them be forced to self-isolate and are made to take personal leave? Look, this is a good practical question. Uh, again, I deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. I mentioned that case before where we consulted with the employee and as a result of that consultation, the individual returning from the United States is self-isolating outside of their home, uh, which obviously reduces issues. Um, if they were self-isolating in their home, there are real questions and again, potential gaps in risk management for the business of the spouse. 
Uh, and again, I'd suggest consultation around what measures are being taken and if it's felt that they're not adequate in the household sense uh, and that it could introduce a risk to your business, then uh, it would be a reasonable direction um, to require the person to self-isolate. Initially, that would have to be on pay, whether it could be through the taking of personal leave um, I would suggest not if you were doing it as part of a, um, an additional requirement, uh, although certainly if the individual was taking steps which put themselves in that position, as we've discussed previously, that may well lead to an opportunity for stand down. Um, of course, if the person's own health was in any way implicated and they did um, become symptomatic, then personal leave would be appropriate. Uh, is there employee duty of disclosure if they have a compromised immune system due to medical condition medication? Um, certainly in your directions around health conditions and exposure here, uh, that is something that you might require. Um, at that level, we've got that going only to our HR manager and one other manager here. Um, but as I mentioned before, you should be issuing reasonable directions to your staff around their own health the health of their family members, their own travel plans, the travel plans of their family members and requirements to reveal any connection uh, with persons uh, who have contracted the virus or who otherwise may be high risk and issue that in writing, give yourself the right to information uh, and go from there. Um, now, I think, unless I'm getting confused across all these pieces of paper I'm being handed, because I apologise, we're just in a room giving this, I think I'm coming to the last question. If the employee's doctor declares the person as asymptomatic and therefore cannot give referral for a certificate, um, should they come back to work? Um, look, it's up to the medical practitioner, not only to look at whether the person is asymptomatic, it's more a question of test, do they have the virus? If they don't, but they still are symptomatic in some way, shape or form, and there is a risk that they could be developing the virus given varying incubation periods. Um, it's up to the medical practitioner to make a recommendation. If they certify that they're fit to come back to work, I would even still as an employer be looking at that circumstance and the quality of that medical certificate and potentially asking further questions. Um, but it, that, that would certainly be a reasonable level of, uh, I guess, assessment of the ability to return to work. Um, so I hope that touches reasonably on some of those questions and I hope I haven't uh, missed any. Um, please feel free to continue to follow us up with any questions if you'd like. And look, I uh, appreciate that's been an all too brief survey of what's a very difficult area for all of us to manage uh, and none of us will get it entirely right. But hopefully by sharing information and a bit of food for thought, it, it helps us all get a bit further down the track. So thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for organising the, the webinar and uh, thank you all for uh, attending and uh, all the best with your own endeavours. I'll just hand briefly back to um, Sarah to close off for Marsh and uh, that'll be that. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael and uh, Madeline and Seb. Um, I am going to send an email out in, in about an hour with the contact details for the, the solicitors, Harmers, and their email address and I'll talk to them about that micro audit. And then the video and the podcast will come out tomorrow. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, you have their email address if you want to ask further questions. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.